Someday, in the not-too-distant future, a piloted glider will make a flight around the world. After circling the Earth, the pilot will control his re-entry and landing at a selected airfield. As the ship descends from the rim of outer space at more than 18,000 miles an hour, the denser atmosphere sets up a glow in the glider's skin, parts of which look like a white-hot poker. Protect the pilot against the rigors of atmospheric re-entry requires the latest developments in aerothermodynamics, heat-resistant metals, rugged structural design with a minimum weight penalty, reliable communications, effective flight controls, and precise guidance. In the end, it takes the cool hand of a skilled pilot to bring his glider in for a conventional landing. This is Dinosaur, a dynamic soaring vehicle. Under this tarpaulin is a full-scale mock-up of the Dinosaur glider currently being developed by the United States Air Force. And this is a model of the glider our Air Force test pilots will be flying. Compared to modern aircraft, it isn't especially large. Not for a vehicle that's going as far and as fast as this one. But what we see here represents a major achievement in aerodynamics. To design and fabricate a vehicle that will stand up under the punishment a glider like this must undergo calls for the finest know-how we have from drawing board to the actual hardware itself. Not to mention some first-rate piloting. For this dinosaur project puts an emphasis on the pilot, on the man. The objective of dinosaur is to put a manned maneuverable glider out on the edge of space and fly it back to earth at will. Follow-on dinosaur vehicles will allow man to perform space missions and return to Earth for a soft re-entry within wide tolerances, landing the winged glider at an airfield of the pilot's choice. The experts have long known and practiced the art of dynamic soaring. When it's properly designed, a glider has remarkable aerodynamic characteristics. And when it's boosted into the air, it returns to Earth safely, even though it is completely unpowered. Of course, the glider's design and configuration are critical if it is to have the desired maneuverability. Reducing the overall weight increases the effectiveness of the booster. Although the concept of dynamic soaring has long been in men's minds, many technical problems had to be licked before we could proceed with confidence. When it comes to working with a man glider, it proves to be quite a trick to combine the glider with a large rocket booster. Once we've launched the glider into space, the problem is to bring it back without it becoming a fireball, like this test nose cone photographed as it re-entered the atmosphere from a ballistic trajectory. A manned glider can ease into the atmosphere. The pilot glides using the dynamic energy built up during launch. The art of staying in his flight corridor, making a carefully controlled letdown at hypersonic speeds with regard for changing air density and glider lift is called dynamic soaring, hence the name dinosaur. In 1958, the Air Force, after consideration of several design and feasibility studies, established the Dinosaur System Program Office at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. A year later, the Boeing Company was selected as system contractor. At the same time, the Martin Company was chosen as associate contractor to supply the rocket boosters. In addition, 
Numerous other contractors throughout the country have supporting roles in this historic project. The most important development requirements are in the areas of stability and control and structures and materials technologies. During re-entry, the glider will encounter structural temperatures of several thousands of degrees. Various materials and structural concepts have been successfully tested under simulated re-entry conditions. Since the beginning, a comprehensive wind tunnel program has been underway. Dinosaur wind tunnel tests have occupied every major tunnel facility available throughout the country. Scale models have been subjected to aerodynamic environments similar to those which will be encountered by the glider in actual flight. Tests have been made to determine how intense heat changes the chemical and electrical properties of the atmosphere around the glider, thus affecting communications. Communication equipment and facilities have been developed to make it possible for the pilot to keep in touch with the test controller at all times. Components were subjected to vibration tests, for the vibrational environment created by the powerful booster engine affect the design and development of each and every dinosaur component, from the struts and joints to the most delicate electronic part. The dinosaur program calls for two kinds of boosters. First, for early test phases, modified Titan intercontinental ballistic missiles will be used. For the orbital mission, the booster must be quite large, equipped with tremendous power. The booster will be provided with large fins to offset the effect of the winged glider on the nose. And there's the sound of the booster engines. This in itself presents another engineering problem. Acoustic chambers are used to study the noise which will hammer away at the glider. Launching a pilot into space in such a hypersonic maneuverable glider as Dinosaur requires the most expert technical backup available. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is participating with the Air Force in the Dinosaur program. NASA's experts bring to bear their long experience with various experimental programs. NASA's Mercury project, in which man rides a ballistic capsule into space and back, has been of value in the preparations for Dinosaur. And the X-15 program. This vehicle's pioneering flights have used control techniques that have been useful in the design and development of Dinosaur. A special centrifuge that resembles the Dinosaur cockpit has been used to determine the effectiveness of the pilot's capabilities under the G-forces he'll be exposed to during launch and re-entry. Protective pressure suits have been developed that provide the pilot with the freedom of movement within the confines of the cockpit. Exploration of glider handling qualities in the six degree of freedom flight simulator has been used as one basis of configuration determination and has familiarized the pilot with the glider's control responses. The men who fly Dinosaur will be specially trained test pilots selected for their adaptability and accommodation to the new conditions they'll be encountering. Before a man steps into a glider for his first flight, he will have been trained to handle his glider under any and all conditions. To carry the Dinosaur project to completion, an orderly flight test program has been planned. During the first phase, the pilot and glider will undergo airdrops from a mother ship. On these flights, the glider will use a rocket engine to achieve the necessary speed for a test of its aerodynamic characteristics and its functional subsystems. These airdrops will be followed by the launching of unmanned gliders for flights down the Atlantic Missile Range. Later, there will be piloted probes out over the Atlantic with landings at downrange sites. When all systems and components have been successfully tested, the dinosaur will be ready for its orbital mission. The pilot's safety is a prime consideration. 
During the preparations for launch, she will be in constant touch with ground personnel in charge of the operation. Main stage. Four. During launch, the G-forces acting on the pilot's body will be no more than he has experienced in conventional jet aircraft. He can abort if anything goes wrong. The pilot monitors every indicator, alert to take any necessary corrective action. His observations are relayed to scientists and technicians following the vehicle's course. The first stage separates. And the second stage accelerates the glider to an even greater velocity. Finally, the glider is in orbit. The centrifugal force of the dinosaur equals the pull of gravity, and everything is in a condition of weightlessness. In this environment, the pilot will keep the glider oriented by using the reaction controls to maintain or change attitude as desired. There is an inevitable advantage in exposing a man's intelligence to this new environment. For what he learns out there will affect the concept of manned operations in aerospace for years to come. The pilot's greatest challenge will come when he descends through the flight corridor. If he loses altitude too fast, the glider will exceed its temperature limits and burn. Now that the air is getting denser, highly heated shock waves develop around the glider. Rudder and elevons respond to the slightest movement of the pilot's controls. He manages the potential and kinetic energy of altitude and speed, maneuvering to hold the temperature of the nose cap and wing leading edges to an acceptable level. The instruments not only tell him where he is, but also indicate what action is to be taken to get back on course. Below, radar eyes watch the sky. As he nears the airstrip, the pilot banks the glider into a 360 degree turn to use up the last bit of excess energy before flaring out for a smooth touchdown. Perhaps now you may sense some of the interplay of men and ideas in industry and government which must be brought together to accomplish the dinosaur experiment. Why are we doing all this? Why dinosaur? Because with dinosaur we're establishing a new technology that enables us to extend Air Force operational capabilities into the hypersonic and orbital flight regimes. Future outgrowths of dinosaur may very well assume vital roles in our national defense. Through this program, we are making use of what we've already accomplished in the missile, space, and aeronautical sciences. Dinosaur is as fundamental to future space operations as were the early experiments at Kitty Hawk. By putting man at the controls, the Air Force has carried forward into space that journey started by the Wright brothers a little more than a half a century ago.